Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Our topic today is digital connections, and my guest, Rebecca Saunders, has a lot to share about that. She's a business and life advisor for ambitious women wanting to do life and business unapologetically on their own terms. She's a champagne-drinking, post-it note-loving, hair-free alopecia who helps female business owners turn their uniqueness into a superpower, celebrate their successes, and create dream lives and businesses by design. At just 22, Rebecca packed a small bag and booked a one-way ticket to Sydney with her laptop and just five. It was here that she founded her first video production company and signed global networking for LinkedIn as her first client. Fast forward a decade and the team operates worldwide across Australia, New Zealand, UK and the US. However, the recent pandemic thrust her business into chaos and all of a sudden her revenue hit zero and she told her staff she was closing the business down. But after a week of sleepless nights, tossing and turning, Rebecca knew failure wasn't an option. She called the team back in and they set to work on transforming the business. And ironically, 2020 became her biggest year since operating her business and she hit the magic seven-figure mark for the first time. In addition, after 25 years of wearing a wig, she decided it was time to reveal herself to the world, live an authentic life and lean into her own uniqueness. After a personal move to the country of New South Wales, Rebecca swiftly realised that she couldn't be alone in having her big dreams, tons of energy and craving for connection with like-minded women and so she did something about it. She created the Champagne Lounge to give every woman around the world a cheer squad and this community is a group of women who dream big together, who want to have more, want to do more and who want someone to give celebrations to them every day. Rebecca now spends her time living her best life, working with clients she loves, inspiring others to use their uniqueness as their own superpowers and so I warmly welcome Rebecca to the politics of everything. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code, the politics of everything, 30, all one word, and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experience as I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Excellent. So I'd love to know what you wanted to be as a kid. Did you have a dream job in mind and how did that pan out in terms of an early career journey? (laughs) I love this question because my first career memory of what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a pilot. I really wanted to travel, be a pilot. I thought that could be a really cool job. But how that panned out, I didn't get very far. (laughs) I, um, I really very much I kind of was put off it because my vision is it. Well, I've got my contact lenses. So I've worn glasses since I was two. And it just, I put it in the too hard basket before I even started, I think, and thought, no, I want to do something a little bit different and not be restricted by potential vision problems, wearing glasses, that kind of thing. So I I didn't pursue the, the pilot thing, actually. Um, but I do travel a lot now. So well, that kind of works. You get yeah. the benefit of that. <laughs> and did you go to uni or did you do some sort of formal study before you, I guess you went into the direction we just discovered yeah. in your in your intro? Yeah, I did go to uni. I actually went to the university in my hometown in High Wycombe in the UK. And the reason I chose that one is I wanted to well, essentially, my my father passed away a few days before my 15th birthday. And so in my head, I was going to go straight into work, get a job, support mom, you know, help out around the house, do a job, do all the things that I thought I should be doing. And she said to me, you have to go to university. Go on, got to do it. Like you'll regret it if you don't. And I, I was the stubborn person in me went, stuff it. Okay, I'm going to do both. So I went to the local university and I continued working at the time in hospitality. I was working waitressing as as we most of us do growing up paying the bills and and having a good time and I chose my course because it didn't have exams and I'm not very good at exams so I chose it because of coursework and I did a media and communications degree yep. and I loved it it was great and I'm so glad I went to uni because not not just 
because, you know, first person through the family to do uni, it's a thing, you know, having a degree is awesome. But because that piece of paper was the starting point to me actually being able to start my life in Australia. If I hadn't have had a degree and a qualification, I couldn't have even started my visa process, which was a huge starting point for me, starting my business and moving to Australia. Absolutely. And I love to just connect those dots because I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, there's not this Mm. massive leap. There's often, if you look back, these decisions you make actually have a huge impact of how you end up where you are today. Massively, massively so. Yeah. And, you know, you don't realize it at the time though. You just no, sort of, you're just living kind of the day to day. Emotions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's interesting. So on the topic of today, which is digital connections, in your view, do you think digital connections can be more than a secondary option to those in real life experiences? Most of us have obviously gone through the Zoom revolution. We do a lot of work online. We live our lives through a small computer, which we have in the palm of our hand most days, mm. allows me to do all my work, all my life on that phone. However, I do love getting together face-to-face with people. I find that's where the magic for me personally really happens. What's your position on it? Do we have to choose one or the other? Is it both? What do you think is is kind of, I guess, your take on this? You definitely don't have to choose one or the other. That's for sure. I think there's a lot of fatigue and, and screen burnout and lots of, I'm over the Zoom thing. Can we do an in real life catch up now? But The beauty of tech, and I think the beauty that really COVID had in in a real sort of subtle way is because everyone jumped online and because, you know, lots of networking happened online, lots of wine drinking happened online, we met different people. I don't know about you, but I met people from all over the world who were jumping into these calls and ventures just because they could and they had nowhere else to be or go. And so my 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 network and my community grew nationally and internationally through that which i think is phenomenal and it's it's the reason you know you mentioned in my bio it's the reason i started the champagne lounge because we you know we talked off offline about moving we both moved during covid you know i've moved country you've moved further north of sydney more space more quiet but it can be really lonely you know we have the lifestyle we've made those choices so i think in real life has its place, but virtual definitely holds its weight still completely, particularly given people's lifestyle choices, the ability to have bigger conversations with different people. Yeah, that's it's definitely going to balance for me. In saying that though, I think big events have almost become a bit of a stickler and I think a lot, of, lot more people are craving and enjoying intimate smaller group connections when they do catch up in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I last week had a client event. It was a big trade show and it was big and it was overwhelming. I hadn't done it since, you know, pre-COVID. But I also within that noticed that people naturally congregate in small groups and the networking was much more bespoke. And I think people are seeking a bit of both really. Like they want the big wow and the keynote speaker and the whole room full of, you know, like-minded people, but at the same time, they are finding ways to connect on a far deeper level than perhaps networking per se was considered a few years ago. Completely, completely. And, you know, I've recently opened my home. This is, this will, this will be a curveball for you. I recently opened my home to strangers to come for dinner, you know, to go, I said to my husband, (laughs) I, I think I'm just going to put a dinner party on and put it on the internet, you know, share it with my network and see who wants to come to dinner. And he's like, do you know everyone though? No, no, I'm just going to see what happens. And I put it out there and I've now hosted two in Mudgee and two in Sydney and they've been sellouts and women from different parts of Sydney, you know, different areas of Mudgee went out in the country, came to dinner because they wanted to meet different people in a small intimate space and they didn't want it to be in a restaurant because that can be loud, you know, difficult to get to. And so, yeah, the intimate small gatherings, the retreats, the quiet dinners, they're all going to, I think that there's a big thing to watch there in terms of connection in smaller groups. So to cast your mind back to a few years ago, and most of us have a bit of PTSD 
during COVID mm. times of, you know, yeah. the world was basically going to fall apart. I remember feeling like that. There were, you know, we just didn't know it was going to happen. We hadn't lived through something like this before. How did you turn around your failing business during that wild ride of 2020? And is there a key moment that you realise that, hey, this is going to be bigger and better than ever rather than the doom and gloom that perhaps most of us predicted and some people unfortunately did experience during that time, mm. particularly for small businesses? Yeah, well, for me, before COVID, my business wasn't wasn't necessarily in the failing bucket, but it was getting into the, it, this is hard work now. This shouldn't be this difficult. You know, I've been going for eight years. This is hard. And so what made business for me difficult at the time pre-COVID was technology had progressed. Everyone knew someone that could do some form of video, you know, had a kid, had a friend that had a kid, had someone through uni, could go to TAFE and find someone to do video content, you know, cheaply. It, equipment was available, people were available, everything was being done at far lower rates than what bigger production companies like I run could compete with. So that's where it got a little bit difficult for me. And that's why I had a chat with the team to say, you know what, guys, I'm, I'm struggling here. Like I'm struggling to get the work in to pay all of us how we've, you know, we'd buy, you know, not even make profits, but just break even at this. It's getting hard. The last 12 months has been hard. I think we should move to a freelance model whereby I'll still pitch for the work to the outside world. It will look exactly the same, but to us internally, I'm not going to have the pressure of salaries and paying you guys before I pay me. And when there's work, there's work for you. You know, we had that conversation. There was a lot of tears involved, you know, but we had the conversation and then COVID hit. And as you said, the world went to disarray and it was all very confusing. But the thing that stood strong for us was positioning and reputation. I had been known in the industry for the best part of a decade and my phone went off the hook. You know, a lot of friends in my network are speakers who are friends with other speakers. I've got a lot of corporate clients in the mix who had to automatically turn conferences into live streams. It was at that moment that I realized that positioning was incredibly important to the success of what we were going to do. And I had an online course at the time, still available now, but I had it. And people went through that. And I opened my calendar and said, book in 15 minutes. I can give you 15 minutes to help you navigate where you're at with the tech side. So we had that in place. And our saving grace really was the fact that we had a studio space. So we had a dedicated soundproof studio space in the heart of Sydney, which could remain open. So live streaming was considered essential services. Ah, in interesting. Of- yeah, right. Because that only- was a bit, especially yeah. people in masks and having to like, you know, We had I don't to know. all wear masks. We had yeah. to all wear masks. But um, on camera, you didn't have to. So mm-hmm. there was protocols on and off and we had to navigate that. But because we had that space, and we could keep people distanced and we could get people from the car park to the studio without seeing anyone, mainly because the building was pretty much a ghost town. Like I was going to say, who was going the to the city during that time? <laughs> right? But we could keep that open, which meant several things. We could keep the work coming in. We could help people. We could give a reprieve to, you know, the odd client that needed just half an hour away from family life and crazy kids. And it that was what it was like for us during COVID. We did not stop. We did so many live streams and helped so many people navigate it virtually that that's what skyrocketed us forward. And I, I can't pinpoint when I knew it was going to be a success, but I did realize very sort of halfway through that, wow, like, we're we're being able to operate here. The rest of the industry is really struggling. I've been able to keep other freelancers and other small businesses in business because I've been throwing them work. And we even filmed across the UK and New Zealand in the heights of lockdowns in both those countries. So we, when there's a will, there's a way. And when you know the right people, you can achieve anything. But um, yeah, it was hard to navigate it was hard to navigate the protocols to make sure we were abiding by yeah. all the regulations. And it kept sort of shifting and there oh, was, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. our lockdown, then we were sort of back in and then we were checking in everywhere and then you had to like the even the how many people could be in a room changed at one point and how yeah. many metres apart you had to be and, you know, all yeah. those bits and pieces. So Constant change. Well yeah. done. 
segueing a little bit to your digital community, which you created from scratch, I guess Mm. having been through that experience as well, what have been some of the biggest learnings as you did this? Like were there some key steps to building this community? Because there are quite a few out there already. And Mm. even though everyone thinks theirs is unique and different, what were some of, I guess, those steps to kind of scale that group and also some of the challenges perhaps that you didn't didn't expect given the fact in some ways digital connections are easier and, and simpler and scalable in a, in a way that, you know, one-to-one in real life can't be. But there must have been, I guess, some ups and downs as, as you were sort of doing this process. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend not to overthink things, Amber. Like I don't I sort of jump in and go, that would be a good idea. Let's let's give it a crack. True entrepreneur. So, yeah, <laughs> we'll work the rest out later. <laughs> Very minor risk assessment. Like what can go wrong? Um, so it was to start it out. Um, I I pretty much built the landing page and went, okay, let's put it out into the world and see what happens. And people jumped into it and I thought, oh, this has got legs. This is cool. Um, and so I started asking, you know, what it was that people loved about being part of the community and being around me and the the answers coming back were the 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 sheer joy and the energy and the vibe of just living life to the max you know so the this premise behind the champagne lounge wasn't a i'm going to teach you how to do x y and z i'm going to give you a roadmap to do blah 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 i didn't want structure like that i didn't want a community where people felt that they'd failed because they forgot to turn up to a masterclass or, you know, kid stuff got in the way or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted it to be fluid and flexible. And to my knowledge, no one's built a community in that way that people pay to be a part of. There's always a business learning or a something, something that they're getting out of it. This was very much a, I'm putting all these virtual events on. There'll be a couple of in real life things if you want to be a part of it, come. If you want to come to one thing a month, great. If you want to come to three things a week, awesome. Um, it, it For me, was as simple as I want it to be a community of business besties that are practically on speed dial. Like That's what I wanted it to be. You know, if you're feeling something, jump in, ask a question, jump in a, in a Zoom call or tonight we're doing Wine Wednesday at five o'clock. And the struggle, the struggle for me was – not feeling as like really, really not forcing myself or allowing myself, I should say, to go down the rabbit hole of, well, this community over here is successful and they run masterclasses every month. Should I run a masterclass every month? Or right. You didn't community- pay attention to what else everyone else was doing, it sounds right? like. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I had to really keep the blinkers on and Really Which is hard, I reckon, that. because, you know, we're obviously in this other community together called Her Empire Biddle with Tina Tower, mm. and that's all about following in some ways a bit of a roadmap. So, yeah, yeah it's tempting, right, to kind it's of so tempting. have a look. <laughs> but I wanted to do it differently. I wanted to do it differently. I wanted it to be flexible. I didn't want it to feel rigid. And the whole premise of it was, has been built on connection to community and celebration. Like the whole, you know what, I've actually nailed the three things on my to-do list this week, despite the craziness of life. Or, you know, that post-it note I put on the champagne last month, Beck, I've smashed that goal. Like I'm going to celebrate now. Thanks for the, you know, tip on celebrating the things that we do as entrepreneurs that otherwise we'd just strive to the next task. You know, we'd go, oh, well, I've done that. What's next? And I want people just to stop and go, hey, I did that. I should be really proud of that. I really, I should be acknowledged for that. I should acknowledge myself for that. We did it. We got there. Okay. Now I've celebrated, acknowledged it. Now what's next, you know, rather than just jumping to what's next all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I I totally understand that. And I think that's probably that mindfulness, which I guess when you're creating something that you want to have your, you know, your ideas and your individuality in is really, really important rather than kind of just replicating something which might've worked for others mm. as well. 
um, which is interesting. So since we're not locked down anymore and Zoom drinks, they're not for everyone, I have to say. They're not for me. I think because I'm at my desk a lot at the moment and so I just want to move and, yeah, I find it hard to sit still at 5 o'clock at night, I have to tell you. How can digital communities, I guess, best scale and create meaningful and lasting impacts? So not seeing as something that's seasonal or for the, for the moment that you're going through but something that keeps building and having value and connections because I think of the best friendships for example that I have we don't necessarily see each other all the time but there is a bond and a connection and an ability to reconnect at any time and it is seamless and I suppose in some ways that's what great digital connections will be able to do for you as well what's your view on that exactly so oh I could go down so many paths to answer this one I think the biggest thing is you've got to listen you've got to listen to the community right so in you saying you know I've had enough of my desk you know we had that conversation I had a conversation like that with a friend the other day and we decided that we'd do like a walk and wine we could still have our wine she could be walking her dog I could be walking my dog but we could do it walking without seeing each other you know it's like almost like a phone call meetup rather than a physical one or a digital one so you could, you know, you can scale things up to have as many people on that call as you, as you want to, and obviously test it and try it. And I think you've got to be able to be open to adapting and listening to what your community wants and being not afraid to try to do something different. You know, when I opened up my house and said, come as strangers, leave as friends, the comments I got back from that were just, I'm sorry, you're inviting people into your home that you don't know. Yep. Let's see what happens. You know, so I think as digital communities, we can try different things and be open to trying it and not be scared to fail. You know, people join communities and they follow you. You know, we're both part of Tina's. I've got my community that follow me that go, I love being in your orbit. You know, I love just jumping in and having that taste of taste of the champagne lounge or taste of her empire builder or taste of business chicks or whatever the, the vibe is. It's owning that vibe and owning why the community exists. And I think if you can do that, then the scalability of it is, uh, and the ability to keep people coming in is endless. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. And I think that's a really, a really relatable answer too, to about why people want to have those connections and keep coming back as well. Are there any trends that you're seeing for leveraging our digital connections? I think most of us, you know, if I look on my LinkedIn, for example, I've got 6,000 connections. I don't probably don't even know most of them, or I've worked with them such a long time ago. I can't quite remember who they are. Is there ways in which we can, I guess, be better with our, our digital communities and our connections that we make? I think, yes, I, actually there definitely is. You know, we're, we're very good as entrepreneurs as business owners we go one way or the other we create a heap of content we put it out there or we kind of create none and there's crickets happening right so I think one of the big things is to to be consistent with the things you're putting out and sharing but most importantly answer the comments you know jump in if people have taken the time to read something you've posted or put out into the world and they've commented on it even if it's just a love this you know thanks. Thanks, so-and-so. Thanks so much for for showing an interest, you know, hope you're well. Jumping in and answering the comments is something that I see a lot of business owners and community builders fail at because it's, you sort of set and forget and you schedule your social posts and you do that and you forget to go back and actually engage with the comments or with the messages and they can get lost really easily. So it's actually as simple as, for me, I say it's simple, I've trained myself to do this, you know, putting a half an hour in my calendar every morning and every afternoon to look at the comments and what people have said and to respond to them because no one's going to feel like they're loved, welcomed and part of a community or your orbit or your network if you don't take the time to communicate with them. Absolutely. And not one way, right? There's a real temptation Mm -hmm. to only make announcements or, you know, kind of, you know, when you've got some news or you want to celebrate or ask a question and ask, you know, the Brains Trust online to help you. I think it's um, it's important to be in, in multiple kind of ways when you communicate. So sometimes you're encouraging, sometimes you're advising, sometimes you're just saying yay, or sometimes you're just asking a question and that's okay too. Yeah, completely. And it's okay to jump into the community groups you're in, Facebook groups, and like the occasional comment or, you know, spend 10 minutes just scrolling to see if you can help someone. 
I think one of the big things just to be mindful of, though, is give yourself a time limit so you don't end up, you know, scrolling into the cave of doom and staying there for hours on end because <laughs> that can get re- you can get sucked in really easily. But yeah, having those those conversations in different ways, so it's a give and take situation and not just take, take, take. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really important as well to be mindful of. So changing tack a little bit, what is the best advice that you've ever been giving in life or business and why that particular piece of advice? Best advice. I've got two. Can I have two? Oh, you can have two. <laughs> First one, I was I was probably nine, ten at the time. And I remember my dad saying to me, try everything once. I was like, okay. We weren't talking, you know, we weren't doing the, the drugs and alcohol conversation. It was more a <laughs> not activity, generally. Most parents you know, don't advise that. <laughs> more an activity sort of try try it. You might like it, you know, like give it a go. And that has stead strong for me for the for well t- till this day even now I'm like well what's the, what's the worst that can happen like we'll just give it a crack if it works great if it doesn't we've learned something we'll do something different or we had an adventure so that's been one of the big ones and then more recently last year someone co- just in co- passing conversation she was like you know what best piece of advice I ever got she said worry about things that worry can solve I'm like oh that's a good one you know, like when you're traveling or find yourself going, okay, well, what if people comment badly or what if people think this or what if this or what if that? Can't control any of it. So just let it go. I'm like, okay, like that's fun. So that's also been very front of mind for me for the Absolutely. last year, particularly when I'm starting something new. If we spoke again in a year's time, Rebecca, what would be your number one goal to have achieved and why? I would love to see a thousand women in this in the champagne lounge and the reason for that being i know the power of connection conversation having someone there just to sense check things and so to see that grow globally and have a thousand women all just jumping in when they need help or want to support because they feel a little bit like they need a chat that to me is cool the idea of someone sitting at home and not being able to jump online and ask a question or reach out for help if they need it is you know it breaks my heart so to be and have that community that I can get a thousand women in there in the next 12 months would be amazing awesome well we'll keep in touch and see if that happens you'll <laughs> be posted yeah <laughs> final takeaway message for us today as we wrap up our conversation about the politics of digital connections I think you've got to just put yourself out there you really do reach out say hello be you know be part of that community and not be afraid that not be afraid to ask say hi or have a chat, I think is is the big thing to take away. Well, that's been great advice and a really interesting conversation today. And if you do want to connect further with Rebecca, of course, there'll be some details on the show notes. Until next time, take care. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.